I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello, you found the latest edition of Local Leaders from VLGA Connect, where we talk to mayors and CEOs from councils around Victoria and get to know them just a little bit better. And joining us today, it's the Mayor of Marybeck City Council, Councillor Angelica Panopoulos. Councillor Panopoulos, welcome to Local Leaders. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here and, and nice to meet you as well. Uh, congratulations on uh, not just being a councillor and a mayor of Marybeck, but I understand you're the youngest ever mayor of Marybeck. Is that right? I think so. I think so. Is, is, that, a, is that a status or a badge that you were looking to achieve? Uh, it was definitely not my intention. I think it's, um, it's a great coincidence. But um, no, it's not <laughs> something yeah. that I was looking to to put to my name. So tell us a bit about yourself and your background. How do you come to be a local councillor in the first place? So my journey to local government and local politics was actually through refugee rights activism. Um, back when I was in high school, I volunteered a fair bit with the Refugee Action Collective and helped to organise um, rallies and protests and public forums about refugee policy. Um, and through that, I guess I kind of, I saw the lay of the land in terms of refugee policy across um, Labor, the Liberals and the Greens. And I saw uh, who was showing up more and who had a kinder and humane refugee policy. And from there, um, I guess that's how I dipped my toe into politics generally. Mm. Um, and I volunteered on a couple of elections, um, the main one being the 2019 federal election. Um, and slowly, slowly, people would suggest to me, oh, you should put your hand up for something one day. And then council was coming up and I was supposed to go uh, overseas right. with with, um, with my sister on a, you know, Europe 2020 trip. And obviously that didn't happen. And so um, pre-selection in my ward opened up for council. And I thought, well, I've seen some of the great work that people before me have done in the area. I've also seen what happens, say, at the state and the federal level when um your area is a safe seat and it gets neglected. Um, and I thought, well, this could be a great opportunity to to really um, continue and kickstart some more work in, yeah. in my community. How did you find that experience of running for council, particularly in a COVID environment? It was a pretty unique election period, wasn't it? And one that we most likely won't see again. I, I hope we won't have to uh, go through another COVID election. It was Oh, it was really interesting. Um, we were very limited in what we could do. So we basically just letterboxed our municipality quite a few times. We had a lot of placards on people's houses and a whole bunch of online advertising. So, you know, the rules were constantly changing. We didn't know how far we could go. We had a 5K limit. My ward is a bit bigger than 5K, so it was unclear if I could actually go all the way to Brunswick West and Pasco Vale South yeah. from where I live. Yeah. Um, and so we just decided. You know, these are the things we know that we can do. We know that we can do them well, so let's do it. Um, and I think that sort of flexibility um, in in campaigning really helped us out a fair bit. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was difficult um, and really interesting and I think taught me a lot in, um, I guess, yeah, figuring out what you can do with the resources and the situation that you've got and being a bit resourceful. So you've talked about being politically aware and politically active before you became involved in council. How would you describe the environment for someone who is politically aware? Because local government, generally, people don't see it as a, as a level of politics per se, do they? It really depends on who you ask. Um, and I think where we are in Metro Melbourne and like in the inner city mm. to the inner suburbs, people are seeing it a bit more in terms of party colours or yeah. different um, styles of doing things in politics. And so, um, you know, I think it's it's it provides a really good, um, I guess, opening into local government. So with, you know, I guess the activism side of things and being really um, clued into the community and knowing how to get your point across um, and being firm on, on things that you care a lot about, it's definitely helped with that. Mm. But also, um, you know, there's a lot of reading and there can be a fair bit of bureaucracy and just kind of sludging through the details. And so I think uni has helped me <laughs> with that. So it's kind of, I wouldn't say that being politically aware 
or having a history of activism or having a history in, you know, being a staffer in someone's office or anything like that. I don't think that's a prerequisite at all. Uh, sludging through the details. I like that. I might quote you on that one, <laughs> oh, <no>. Angelica. <laughs> um, so were there particular issues that you you wanted to be able to move the needle on and how do you score yourself on that now? I think oh, it's a bit hard now to to think about it, I think because I've, I've learned so much um, over the past couple of years, but something that I was always interested in was um, our tree planting and our pooling um, and I guess the health of our two, our two main creeks, which are the Mooney Ponds Creek and the Mary Creek. Um, and I think we have made progress on that. We we have um, you know targets for urban urban canopy for sorry for tree canopy and um, urban cooling because we are very hot um, mm. where we are. And as there's more density in development, um, we're losing trees, and so we need to be able to to fill that gap and to progress, not just hold the ground on mm. it. Um, and so it's taken a little bit of time to to build up, but I'm really pleased in in this year's council budget we've um, upped our budget for tree planting and so over the next four years we're basically doubling it which is really really good um you know I'm still going to be pushing for more mm. um I think it is such an important thing and will be incredibly important when we get to the heat waves in summer um yes. and there's just so many benefits to to tree planting and something within our power as a local government um council so that's something that I think I started off uh, during the election campaign or early on in council thinking we need to do more of this, but I didn't quite have the knowledge about the strategies and, and the, the policy and the logic behind where things were planted and in what way. And I feel like I've got a greater understanding um, of that now. Yeah, it, it's a it's a big issue right across the country, isn't it, for, for councils? And it's one of those issues where you're making an investment in a longer term future. And sometimes that gets in the way of some of those short-term things that need doing, don't they? So how do you find that decision-making process as a local mm. councillor when you've got to weigh up those immediate needs versus long-term needs? It's a it's a really, really good question um, and because there's always so many things that need to be funded and not enough money. Yeah. It's always, um, I think, the way it is at local government. But the way I think about it is I was elected to both represent the community now but also to future-proof things and to set things up for the future. Um, you know, I just think, especially as a younger um, younger person on council, this is going to be my future um, and also people of my generation. And so it's kind of incumbent upon us to try and set something up so it's not as bad <laughs> as yeah. what it could be, um, yeah. however many years down the line. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of, it should be inherently part of the role thinking more than just like one or two years ahead. Well said. And it's in the act as well. I think it's I mean, incumbent yeah, upon councils. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, but but yeah. remembering that and acting in accordance with that uh, can be two different things, can't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Angelica, you've had a pretty big uh, change while you've been on your first term of council, and that is the name change from Moreland mm -hmm. to Marybeck. Were you expecting a decision of that significance before you got into council? No, I, no. I was not. I had no clue about, um, you know, what what our council area was originally named after. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, when we got that, when we heard and when we got that letter, um, was it late 2021, I think it was, from memory? Around then. Mm. Yeah, so when we got that letter then, I just read it and I was like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> this is awful. Um, but. I was quite pleased in how we decided to take action on it mm. um, and do that big consultation piece on what people wanted the new name to be. And I think um, it was a really big education piece too on the history of this area because, you know, Moreland um, as a council has only existed since amalgamation when Coburg, Brunswick and bits of Broadmeadows were combined. So it's not like mm. it's been a name that's uh, been our council name for, for decades and decades. Um, reading the media reports, it seemed like uh, the whole issue was being uh, very divisive. Did you feel it was divisive at the time or was that partly just how it was being portrayed? I think a lot of it was how it was portrayed. Mm. Um, and, you know, you find this on so many, so many issues. When you just sit down and talk with someone and have a conversation, say, hey, this is what we were named after, um, you know, a slave plantation. They just think, well, 
oh, like we can't be named yeah. after that. That's an awful thing, especially yeah. for a city like ours where, where, we, where we pride ourselves on being really progressive and, um, and ambitious and bold and trying to be really inclusive. It just, you can't be named after a slave plantation. I think once people read the info or you had a chat with them, they understood that. So, yeah, I think it's, it's along like the one-on-one conversations that you have. Um, and another issue that you've recently tackled is uh, becoming a nuclear-free uh, status municipality, um, and and probably have copped some criticism about getting involved in issues that aren't, in some people's view, core issues for local government. How do you respond to those criticisms? So on that, you know, we have so many different um, advocacy and policy stances, whether that's on refugees and people seeking asylum, on climate, mm. um, on transport, on a myriad of things that community tells us is important to them and we know that as a level of government um, we have an ability we've got a bit more of a megaphone so we can project what community is telling us is important to them we we do do our core services and I think that's really important to state in that you know we've got some incredible libraries incredible sports facilities playgrounds um, you know we're slowly slowly improving our uh, our footpaths and our roads like we're, we are doing all of that, and I think we can do more than one thing at a time um, and, yeah, address those core services as well yeah. as taking a stand on some of the bigger issues that yeah. affect people in our communities. Um, let's talk a little bit about you and your, uh, your, your <laughs> you, the person outside of, of, of council. What would you be doing if you weren't a councillor and a mayor? Well, this year, so I finished uni at the end of last year, so this year I would have been... Um, doing my practicing certificate so I could be admitted as a lawyer um, and I'd probably start working <laughs> yep. by now. Yep. I probably, yeah, would have applied for maybe a few grad jobs and maybe yeah, doing some work in a, in a law firm or some sort of policy work. <laughs> so you put that you put that on hold for now, have you? Yeah, yeah. So it was um, actually quite convenient timing in, in when I, for, um, you know, when I finished my degree. So I finished oh, like late October. Yeah, late October-ish of last year. And then, of course, I had the state election um, and then mayor. And so, yeah, I just didn't apply for any any yeah. grad roles. And, and how does the mayoral role fit you? Is it comfortable? I think it's very comfortable. Yeah. Um, no, like like any job, it, I think it, ta- it definitely took a few months to, to transition into it um, and to figure out what I'm doing how do I want to chair these meetings? How do I want to be engaging with people? And what are my priorities? Um, it happened quite quickly for me. So, um, you know, there was just a lot of that adjustment, like with any new job. But now um, I feel quite comfortable and confident um, in the role. Um, and I'm really enjoying, I guess, like the, the best part is getting to meet so many people mm. um, and seeing so many people who are doing good work in the community. I think that's that's the best part of this job. How does it feel to be the first among equals when you've got people around the table with a lot of experience at the local government level? Has that has that been a challenge for you? Not really, to be honest. No? I think I thought it would be more of a challenge, and and that was even honestly just getting elected in the first place. Forget yeah. forget about being mayor, just being a councillor. That was one of my biggest concerns. But um, I think you learn very quickly that if you just like read the papers. Um, and you try and come at things from a a like a genuine, a caring perspective, and you're passionate about the community. Like it's it's not that hard. And I don't think that having um, decades of experience in policy work or, or political work should be a prerequisite for anyone putting their hand up because like you know we're supposed to represent the community. So um, how, how did you how did you go with the learning curve becoming a councillor? Everyone tells me. They weren't prepared for the reading. Um, yeah. How does that sit with you or how, was it what you were expecting? It was a lot of reading. It yeah. still is. Our yeah. agendas can be huge. Like we've cracked a thousand pages a wow. couple of times this term and it's mm. it's it's huge. But um, to be honest, law school prepared me a lot for reading um, a mm. lot of a lot of information and trying to get to the get to the crux of what it's trying to get at quite quickly. So I think that did help me. Um, and I think it can't be understated the fact that I was elected as part of a team of people um, from my party. And so, you know, where I've got strengths, um, you know, I can help some of the others in the team and where they've got strengths, they can help me out and we can talk through problems and 
and um, really work collaboratively and delegate out tasks. And mm. I think that is such such an important part um, of being on council, regardless of, of the makeup of your council, is finding those people um, that you can work with and mm. can trust to, to help each other out when, mm. you know, there might be times when you're ridiculously busy and you can't be on top of everything. Um, having someone that you can call up and, and talk to I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah, that that's really interesting. How have you found the community has responded to having a 23-year-old female mayor? Well, I'm 24 now. Oh, 24 um, now. 23 so, when you were elected. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's been really good. Yeah. Um, there'll always be a couple of comments online, you know, criticising, saying, where's her life experience? But yeah. people obviously haven't realised that I've been doing you know, the activism thing since I was like 16, have been working in fast food and retail since I was 16 and have got a bunch of work experience. But the vast majority of people have been really, really positive and quite pleased to see, I think, um, a bit more of a fresh or newer energy and um, something that was really surprising to me and, like, yeah, it's just, just surprising is, um, you know, there's been like a couple of, like, younger girls, say, who are, you know, eight or ten, and um, they, like their their parents, will come up to me and say that their daughters are, you know, they their daughters are, I guess, kind of look up to me or um, are, are thrilled to have me yeah. as the mayor. And so it's a very odd thing because you don't think of it when you put your hand up. Um, but there's been a couple of of parents of young kids that have said that it's great to have a, a younger woman in the role, and it's um quite heartwarming. I, mean, this- I did not expect that at all. That that role model status can be a two way street though, can't or a double edged. What I'm trying to say, double edged yeah. sword. Does it <laughs> places more pressure on you, doesn't it? Yes and no. In yeah. in a little, like you think if I think about it too much, it will. Um, but you know, I'll just kind of accept the compliment and keep on trying to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah, did not expect it, but it's great. You mentioned a few online comments. Interested to understand or get your philosophy on how you deal with that online mm. element. We we hear about keyboard warriors, uh, people behave in a way mm. uh, that they wouldn't when they're with you face to face. Do you read all that stuff? What's your approach? Um, it depends on who is commenting um, and what they're commenting. So I think if sometimes there's questions or there's comments that are left that can be a bit snarky, but um you know, I can see that people are genuine or there's someone that doesn't usually comment on my post and I might respond or I might ignore it. Um, usually if things are a bit offensive, I'll just hide it instead of blocking them. Mm. Um, but then if there's a, there's been a couple of people where if they just are relentlessly commenting or saying things about me that aren't true, like I'll just block them. Um, I think I used to think, oh, like um, don't don't block people or like let people say what they want. But also it's, it's, if it's on my Facebook or my Instagram, like I choose what happens yeah. there. I'm the one running it. I don't have anybody else running social media for me. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have any qualms if someone's commenting relentlessly and things that aren't true or things that are just mm. nasty, mm. they can just get blocked. Were, were you prepared for that? Otherwise. Were you prepared for that stuff to be happening? Yeah, yeah, I think everybody kind of gives you the warnings and the heads up. So mm. that was um, really good that I didn't go into it entirely um, unprepared. And so I think that's really important. But also um, a lot of the earlier criticisms were about me being part of the political party that I'm with and like that sort of party-based criticism. So it wasn't really about me and it still isn't really about me because they don't know me. So yeah. I'm not I'm not super concerned or stressed by it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's no, fine. Uh, th- that's good to hear. It's a very mature and relaxed uh, attitude to it. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, w- w- is there anything on your list of things that you'd like to achieve while you're mayor that you haven't been able to get done yet or is on the way? It's a really good question. Um, I think I'd like to see, I guess, I'll, the first thing on the tree planting stuff, I want to see those trees planted. That'll happen yeah. in the next year or so. Um, but that was one that I've really, like, really, really pushed for. Um, but I think on on another note, things around housing um, are really important. Like we've got Mary Beck Affordable Housing as this 
vehicle at arm's length from council um, and we're just starting our first project on Wilkinson Street in Brunswick um, and I'm keen to see it pick up more and you know we're talking about housing um, I think at the state and federal level in ways that we have never talked about before um, and I know that councils are being blamed for holding up decisions when it's not factually true mm. at ours at least so I'm kind of keen to see how we can raise the issue um, and try and use the assets um, or use what we've got to to help um, bring about more affordable and good quality housing supply in our municipality. But, mm. you know, that's, I guess, a bit broader and maybe a bit more down the line or setting up the wheels in motion now because, of course, this mayor um, thing, it's it's one year. So by the time you adjust to the role, it's halfway over, which is... Um, an interesting system. <laughs> yeah, you me you mentioned planning there briefly. As we record this, and this probably won't go out for a few weeks, uh, the Operation Sandon report has come out, and there's a range of recommendations that look like uh, taking some planning decision powers away from councils. Just reading between the lines yeah. from the premier's comments, um, you've had some experience already with some of that fast tracking stuff being taken out of your hands. Yeah, so we have had um, a couple of decisions that have gone to the minister instead of coming through the council chamber. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think our biggest thing is that less than, I think it's like less than 4% of planning applications are refused at council. The ones that are refused often get mediated and negotiated to an agreement um, between council and the applicant. So it kind of works out anyway. Um, and we have, like, just walk through Brunswick and Coburg and even like the suburbs like Glenroy, you can see that there has been a lot of development. Um, and I guess what I'm really, what I want is good quality development. And so there's like 24 of us councils that have put forward a planning scheme amendment to improve the environmental standards in builds. That's been sitting on the minister's desk for a year. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, we can talk about councils holding things up, um, but we do approve a lot of development. The point is, is that it needs to be good quality and affordable for people. So it would be nice if we had that planning scheme amendment approved. Yeah, that's the CASB one, isn't it? And yeah, um, exactly. I, 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 I did note that uh, the, the CASB um, group welcomed the decision on phasing out gas uh, appliances. So yes. that's a step in the right direction, yes? It is. It is. It's a really good step. Um, but, of course, that's in new builds. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see. Um, I guess, does it count for renovations or redevelopments of existing buildings and what happens with the retrofitting? That mm. will be the really, really big one. Mm. Um, so it's a good step, but we need way more to, to yeah. properly tackle, you know, climate change. Before I let you go, are you enjoying being a councillor and mayor and is it something you see yourself doing for the longer term or have you got higher political ambitions? Uh, I love being um, on council. It is it is such a great, great experience. There are always times... You know, when, when you get frustrated or when you're a bit tired, but um, like I said earlier, it's always meeting people um, and getting to see people in the community and seeing the policies or the things that you've helped fund get built and get done. Like, it's just so rewarding. So, um, yeah, I'm quite happy, quite happy where I am, but um, would never <laughs> rule anything out, of course. <laughs> okay. So uh, <laughs> what I'm reading there is watch this space and you just never know what happens down the track. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you and chatting with you, Angelica. Thank you so much for your time and, and all the best for the rest of your mayoral term and beyond. Thank you so much for having me. Another terrific example there of the new generation of leaders at councils around Victoria. We've had the Mayor of Marybeck City Council, Councillor Angelica Panopoulos, with us today on Local Leaders. Thank you for watching and listening. Stay tuned for more coming from VLGA Connect.